with many remarkable antiquities from ancient Egypt. Among their treasures are 3,000 year old mummies and colossal statues honoring great pharaohs. But there is one item that is more valuable than all the rest. At the entrance to their Egyptian collection is a large stone tablet. One that could be overlooked if not for its conspicuous and prominent position. It's known as the Rosetta Stone, one of the most important treasures of all time. What is the Rosetta Stone? And how did this seemingly insignificant rock forever change our belief in mankind's past? For 2,000 years, the history of ancient Egypt was buried in the sands of time. Travelers and scholars were aware of the existence of these mysterious people, but nothing was known about them. What kind of men built these gigantic pyramids the size of mountains? To what gods did they dedicate their enormous temples the size of cities? And why did they preserve their dead, burying with them treasures beyond belief? Visitors to this ancient world find strange picture writing everywhere. First called hieroglyphs by the Greeks, this mystical language fills the temples, monuments, and tombs. Walls abound with bizarre pictures of animals, human heads, and unknown shapes. Many surround paintings of Egyptians giving offerings to animal-headed gods. Even their dead were buried with this sacred script on their wrappings and coffins. What do these strange carvings say? Did the Egyptians possess black magic medicine and powerful weapons? Would they provide us with answers to the Bible's mysteries? What was needed was a clue, a key to unlock the mystery. Like the rediscovery of ancient Egypt, the finding of an unusual and puzzling tablet would be only the beginning. By the time of Christ, the ancient Egyptians were already legends of a distant past. Greek and Roman historians could only guess at what knowledge this once powerful civilization possessed. As the centuries passed, and Europe had its renaissance, ancient Egypt remained silent, waiting for its own rebirth. It took one of the most powerful men of all time to awaken Egypt from its sleep. A man whose leadership in battle was matched only by his passion for history. During the late 1700s, the French and British were fighting a war for world domination. In 1798, General Napoleon Bonaparte proposed leading the French army on a military invasion of Egypt. If the French could command this crossroads between Europe and Asia, they would control trade and become the most powerful country in the world. By this time, the 29-year-old Napoleon had become a legend in the French army. His victories over Austrian forces in Italy established France and himself as new powers to be reckoned with. Napoleon's sense of history and destiny led him to view Egypt as his next prize. On July 1st, 1798, Napoleon's army sailed into Egypt's port city of Alexandria. In addition to 38,000 soldiers, 167 of France's top scientists and scholars were on board. Rarely have military expeditions had academic interests as well. What was Napoleon's plan? Why was he fascinated with ancient Egypt? Like Alexander the Great, did Napoleon believe his destiny was to annex Egypt on his way towards conquering the world? The egocentric Napoleon viewed Egypt as more than just a cornerstone in his empire. He knew of its legends, its power, and its history. This was the land of the pharaohs. These kings were considered gods by their subjects. They ruled over the world's greatest civilization for 2,000 years. Napoleon was determined to learn their secrets. Like Julius Caesar, Napoleon believed he could win the hearts and minds of the Egyptians. Did he believe he was to be their next pharaoh? As a member of the French Institute of Egyptology, 
Napoleon personally selected the academics who formed his expeditionary force. While the French army swept up the Nile, crushing all opposition, the scholars immediately began their work setting up an institute in Cairo. This became the headquarters for Napoleon's academic expedition. They scattered across Egypt, exploring tombs, climbing monuments, studying, sketching, and painting everything in sight. The wealth of information was unbelievable. Napoleon demanded to be constantly informed. If any answers to their mysteries were uncovered, he wanted to know immediately. While Napoleon's men were busy annexing both Egypt's land and antiquities, England would not stand idly by. Within weeks, the British Navy attacked the French, destroying their ships and laying a two-year-long siege on Napoleon's men. Napoleon himself eventually snuck past the blockade and back to France. His hopes for ruling the world were dashed. As the abandoned French army fought to stay alive, the scientists and scholars were giving birth to modern Egyptology. Racing against their inevitable removal by the British, they stepped up their efforts to copy and analyze as much as possible. The answers to these dormant mysteries had to be found. Ironically, it was neither a scientist nor a scholar, but a soldier who made the most important discovery of all. In mid-July, 1799, as the long siege wore on, the French continued bolstering their defenses. Situated along the Nile as it enters the Mediterranean Sea is a town called Rosetta. In order to rebuild the town's old Arabic fort, men under the command of Lieutenant Pierre Bouchard started to reconstruct the walls. Arabs commonly took material from ancient temples and used them in their own buildings. Unnoticed in these walls, buried since the time of the pharaohs, was a large stone tablet. While the soldiers tore down the fort's walls, the tablet was stumbled upon. Immediately, the soldiers noticed something strange and potentially valuable. Carved on this dusty stone were three types of writing. Greek, a common Egyptian script called demonic, and hieroglyphs. The stone was a kind of magical discovery, and I think it is a piece of extraordinary luck that whoever was there had the perspicacity and the interest to say, gosh, you know, what have we got here? Um, could be important, key <laughs> um, to the hieroglyphs. One can imagine that a less well-informed um, officer might have said, oh, you know, it's just an old stone, build it into the fort. Um, people have often said, you know, thank God it was a French officer, not a British officer, because, you know, they were perhaps a little more intellectually minded. Dubbed the Rosetta Stone, it measured three feet, nine inches high, and two feet, four inches wide. It weighed nearly 1,500 pounds. French General Jacques Menu ordered it sent to the Institute in Cairo to have the Greek translated. What did it say? Could the Greek be used to translate hieroglyphs? The discovery caused an immediate sensation. The Greek language was understood, so scholars quickly translated the text. It was a decree honoring a Greek pharaoh, Ptolemy V, on his one-year anniversary. In exchange for services rendered by him benefiting Egypt, plaques were to be placed in temples throughout the land. It was known the Greeks had ruled Egypt from 300 BC until the decades before Christ. How did this tablet survive for over 1800 years? Did others exist? The actual wording seemed unimportant until the last line was read. This decree shall be inscribed on a stela of hard stone in sacred and native and Greek characters. All three scripts said the same thing. The news spread quickly back to Europe. This stone offers great interest for the study of hieroglyphic characters. Perhaps 
It will even give us the key at last. Courrier de l'Egypte, August 1799. The Rosetta Stone would not stay in French hands long. The British siege was soon to tighten, forcing the French to surrender. How did a French general try to hide the stone and prevent the British from taking possession? During negotiations, English military officers demanded the stone. Did they believe the translated hieroglyphs would reveal military secrets? Would this stone be the voice to end ancient Egypt's long silence? Napoleon's two-year military campaign in Egypt was a complete disaster. Over 9,000 men were killed, and the French Navy was decimated by the British. Those who remained were now trapped in Egypt, isolated by a British naval siege along the Mediterranean coast. However, both scientifically and culturally, the Egyptian expedition was of great and long-lasting importance. This was the birth of modern archaeology, man's search for his own past. And with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, it seemed as if the great secrets of Egypt would be finally revealed. The door was now poised to be opened onto this long, silent land of magic and mystery. The looming deciphering of the hieroglyphs was keenly watched by both the French and English military. French officers in Egypt knew firsthand the power and glory of the ancient Egyptians. The indisputable evidence was before their eyes. The pyramids and temples were obviously built by a great and advanced civilization. If the Rosetta Stone could be used to translate their language, might Egypt's former glory be resurrected and become that of France? How quickly could the French decipher the stone and thus read the hieroglyphs? Would the code be cracked before the British forced their surrender? Under military orders, scholars at the Institute raced to complete the deciphering. The Rosetta Stone had three texts written on it, each in a different script. Reading top to bottom, they were hieroglyphs, demonic, and Greek. The Greek section told of the tablet having the same information written in all three. While Greek was easily understood, several obstacles stood in the way of using it to translate the two Egyptian scripts. First and foremost, nobody had been able to speak or read either Egyptian language for almost 2,000 years. The French had no idea as to what any of the Egyptian symbols or words meant. Were the signs phonetic, like an alphabet, or were they pictorial, like Chinese character writing? Without any clues, they had to start from scratch. A second hurdle was that the stone was broken at the top and sides. The hieroglyphic section at the top was the most damaged. Only 14 lines of text existed. The demonic section in the middle had all of its 32 lines of text, but was broken along the right side. The Greek section consisted of 54 lines. The frustrated French had no way of knowing which words or lines of text matched up with which Greek words. As it turned out, time was not on their side. In August 1801, Two years after the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, the English ended their siege, attacking and forcing the French to surrender Egypt. As part of the withdrawal agreement, French military officers were allowed to keep all their personal possessions, but the Institute in Cairo had to hand over all of their discoveries. The academics were furious. What right did the British military officers have to abscond with the legacy of the past? Egypt belonged to mankind. What would become of these priceless treasures? When the British got the French to surrender at Alexandria, the Rosetta Stone was already famous, although I think it was more famous in France than it was in Britain, but it was certainly regarded as one of the spoils of war, and it was regarded as one of the, the fruits of the British victory. The French were distinctly reluctant to let 